you see two bikes screaming down the main straight at over 200 miles per hour. They look similar. The riders are in the same iconic tuck. The sound is a deafening roar of pure power. From the grandstands, it's easy to think you're watching the same species of machine, but you're not. You are witnessing a fundamental clash of ideologies, a battle between a purpose-built weapon of war and a highly refined production-based engine. And the difference between them is the very soul of motorcycle racing. This is the brutal, beautiful truth of MotoGP versus Moto2. On the surface, the junior class is the perfect training ground, a spec series where talent is supposed to shine. But look closer and you'll see it's a cage, a brilliant, competitive, but ultimately restrictive cage. And today we're breaking down the 15 key reasons why the 760 design, everything is optimized for power delivery, throttle response, and chassis packaging. The sound is a byproduct of pure performance. The Moto 2 Triple, however, is a masterpiece of production-based engineering. It's derived from the engine in the street triple road bike. Its character is tuned for reliability, cost-effectiveness, and a broad power band. That beautiful howl is the sound of a brilliant engine being used in a racing context, not the sound of an engine born from racing. And this fundamental difference in origin story dictates everything that follows, starting with the single most important number on the spec sheet. Two, the power gap, where 150 horses are left behind. Let's talk numbers because they don't lie. A Moto2 machine in its current Triumph guise produces around 140 horsepower. It's a strong, potent number, and it propels these bikes to incredible speeds. But now let's look at the monsters in the Premier class. A MotoGP bike in 2024 is knocking on the door of 300 horsepower. Let that sink in. We are not talking about a small deficit. We are talking about a canyon. A MotoGP bike has more than double the power of a Moto2 bike. This isn't just about top speed. It's about how that power is delivered. The MotoGP machine has so much excess power that managing it becomes the rider's primary job. The traction control, the wheelie control, the engine braking maps, all of it is there to help the rider harness a level of energy that is simply unimaginable in the junior class. A Moto2 bike is fast, a MotoGP bike is a force of nature, but raw power is nothing without control. And this is where the real magic and the real cost of GPT begins. Three, the chassis a frame versus an organism. In Moto2, the chassis is a spec part. Every team uses the same Calex chassis. It's a brilliant piece of engineering, a known quantity that creates a level playing field, but it is a static piece of metal. In MotoGP, the chassis is a living, breathing, and constantly evolving organism. Factory teams like Ducati, Yamaha, and Honda don't just buy a chassis. They fabricate their own from carbon fiber and exotic alloys. They run endless simulations. They create chassis with different flex characteristics, stiffness profiles, and weight distributions for different tracks. A MotoGP chassis isn't just a frame to hold the engine. It's a finely tuned part of the suspension designed to work in harmony with the tires and the aerodynamics. It's a custom tailored suit, while the Moto2 chassis is a very high quality off the rack size. And, and speaking of suspension, the difference there is just as stark. Four, the suspension wore springs versus supercomputers. Look at the front forks of a Moto2 bike. You'll see traditional externally adjustable spring forks. They are high end precision instruments, but their principles are decades old. Now look at a MotoGP bike. For years, the top teams have been using sophisticated front suspension systems like Ducati's whole shot device and now increasingly fully fledged electronic front suspension. These systems can literally lock the fork travel at the push of a button to prevent wheelies under acceleration and then unlock for braking and cornering. This is technology that trickles down from Formula One. It's active, dynamic, and it fundamentally changes the physics of the motorcycle. In Moto2, the suspension is a passive component. In MotoGP, it's an active player in the battle for grip, but perhaps the most visually dramatic evolution in recent years has happened not on the ground, 
but in the air. Five, the aero revolution, slicing the wind. Look at a Moto2 bike, it's sleek, uh, it's beautiful. It has a small, elegant fairing. Now look at a modern Moto G bike. It looks like it was designed by a mad scientist. It has wings, lots of them. It has scoops, vents, and complex surfaces that look like they belong on a fighter jet. Aerodynamics in MotoGP is no longer about just reducing drag. It's about generating downforce. These wings press the bike into the track, allowing for mind-bending corner speeds and incredible stability under braking. This creates a new physical challenge for the riders as they must now fight against the bike wanting to stand up in the corners due to the aero load. Moto2 has dabbled with small winglets, but it is light years behind the all-out aero war being waged in MotoGP. The premier class bikes are no longer just motorcycles, they are ground effect aircraft. And all that downforce and power is useless if you can't stop. This is where braking becomes an extreme sport. Six, the braking zone, steel versus carbon ceramic. When a Moto2 rider squeezes the brake lever, they are using steel brake discs and traditional pads. They are phenomenal brakes, capable of generating immense stopping power. When a MotoGP rider touches the brake, they are activating carbon-carbon brakes. These are the same technology used on the Space Shuttle and in Formula One. They are fantastically expensive and have a critical property. They only work optimally at extremely high temperatures. That's why you see MotoGP riders dragging their brakes on the straights. They are keeping the discs hot and in their operating window. The stopping power is otherworldly, allowing them to break later and harder than would ever be physically possible with steel discs. It's another layer of complexity and performance that separates the two categories. But all this technology would be useless without the most important contact patch in racing. Seven, the Tire Canyon, spec rubber versus a bespoke black art. Moto2 runs, on a spec Dunlop control tire. It's a fantastic, consistent tire that, like the chassis, creates a level playing field. Every rider has the same compound and construction. MotoGP is a tire war. Michelin brings a vast range of compounds and constructions to every single race weekend. There are soft, medium, and hard options for the front and rear, and often special constructions for specific tracks. Factory teams get access to custom tires, sometimes with different casings or compounds made specifically for their bike's characteristics. The choice of tire is a strategic decision that can win or lose a race. The MotoGP rider is not just managing his bike, he's managing the complex life cycle of a hyper-specialized piece of rubber. And to manage all of this, you need a brain, a very, very powerful one. Eight, the electronic brain, a tractor versus a fighter jet. The electronics on a Moto2 bike are sophisticated for the racing world, but they are limited. They provide traction control and some engine management, but it's a relatively basic system compared to the Premier class. A MotoGP bike's ECU is a supercomputer. The level of granular control is insane. Riders and engineers have maps for everything. Traction control, wheelie control, engine braking, power delivery. They can have different maps for each corner of a track. They can adjust engine braking sensitivity while leaning at 60 degrees. This electronic suite is what allows a rider to even begin to use the 300 horsepower available. It's the difference between the electronic aids on a high performance sports car and the fly-by-wire systems on a fighter jet. One assists the driver, the other becomes an extension of the pilot's will. This leads us to the single most important component in any racing vehicle, the person in control, nine. The physical demand, a workout versus a battle for survival. Riding a Moto2 bike is physically brutal. It requires immense core strength, cardiovascular fitness, and mental fortitude. The riders are true athletes, but riding a MotoGP bike is something else entirely. It is a constant, violent fight for control. The acceleration forces are so strong they can tear the rider's hands from the handlebars. The braking forces are so immense that riders must support their body weight with their arms while experiencing what feels like multiple G's of deceleration. The aero loads try to rip them from the bike in high-speed corners. A MotoGP rider isn't just riding a bike, they are wrestling a barely contained explosion for 45 minutes. 
the physical and mental stamina required is on another planet, and the cost of developing these earth-shattering machines, it's just as astronomical. 10. The Budget Chasm Millions versus pocket change. The entire Moto2 grid runs on a budget that is a fraction of what a single factory, Moto G, spends. The cost-capped, spec-engine nature of Moto2 is its greatest strength for competition, but it's also its greatest limitation. A factory MotoGP program has a budget well over $100 million. That money pays for the armies of engineers, the endless R&D, the carbon fiber fabrication, the wind tunnel time, and the custom-made everything. This financial firewall is the real-world barrier that separates a production-based formula from the limitless prototype world. The technology on a MotoGP bike isn't just better, it's orders of magnitude more expensive. But what about the engine itself, the heart of the machine? 11. The Engine Philosophy Broad Power Band versus Peak Power The Triumph Triple in Moto2 is tuned for a broad, usable power band. This is intentional. It allows for closer racing, more overtaking, and rewards rider skill in managing momentum. A MotoGP engine is tuned for one thing, peak power output at the highest possible RPM. Drivability is a secondary concern to be managed by the electronics. The power band is much narrower and more explosive. This is why MotoGP riders are constantly working the clutch and shifting. They are dancing on a knife's edge of power, keeping the engine in its tiny violent window of optimal performance. The Moto2 engine is designed to be ridden. The MotoGP engine is designed to be unleashed. And then there's the transmission, the gateway for all that power. 12. The seamless shift, a pause versus an instant. When a Moto2 rider clicks the gear lever, there's a momentary cut in the ignition and drive. It's a split second, but it's enough to upset the chassis and cause a tiny, manageable loss of traction. A MotoGP bike uses a seamless shift transmission. This engineering marvel allows the bike to shift gears without any interruption in power delivery. The rear wheel never stops driving. This is a huge advantage under acceleration, especially when leaned over, as it provides unparalleled stability and drive out of corners. It's a subtle difference on a spec sheet, but a monumental difference on the track. Now let's talk about something that seems simple, the start. 13, the launch control choreography. Both classes have sophisticated launch control systems, but the complexity is not the same. The MotoGP system is a multi-stage, deeply integrated choreography. It manages clutch slip, engine RPM, and traction control in a delicate ballet to get 300 horsepower to the ground without a high side or a wheelie. The stakes are simply higher. A bad start on a Moto2 bike loses you a few positions. A bad start on a MotoGP bike with its explosive power can lead to a crash before you've even reached the first corner. The system has to be more intelligent and more robust because the consequences of failure are catastrophic. Finally, we have to talk about the overall philosophy, the very reason these two classes exist. 14, the development freeze versus the innovation race. Moto2 is a sealed engine formula. The engines are all the same and are not touched by the teams. The chassis is largely frozen. This creates fantastic close racing where the rider makes the difference. MotoGP is an innovation arms race. There is no freeze. From the first test to the last race, factories are bringing updates, new aerodynamic packages, new chassis parts, new engine specs, new electronic software. The bike that wins the first race is not the same bike that finishes the season. Moto2 is a snapshot of brilliant frozen engineering. MotoGP is a living, evolving project that never, ever stops. So what does all this mean for a rider making the jump? 15, the rookie wall, a shock to the system. When a top Moto2 champion like Celestino Vietti or Tony Arbolino makes the leap to MotoGP, they hit what is known as the rookie wall. It's not just about going faster, it's about relearning everything. They have to adapt to the physical violence of the bike. They have to learn to trust the carbon brakes. They have to understand the complex electronics and how to work with their crew chief to tailor dozens of settings. They have to process the insane amount of data these bikes generate. The riding style that made them a champion in Moto2 is often a starting point, a foundation that must be completely rebuilt to handle the prototype beast. 
it is the hardest transition in motorsports. So there you have it. The 765 cubic centimeter Triumph Triple um, is a masterpiece of modern engineering, a jewel that has created some of the most exciting racing on the planet, but it exists within a controlled ecosystem. A MotoGP prototype is the result of a no-holds-barred, budget-is-no-object engineering war. It is the absolute pinnacle of two-wheeled technology where every single component is pushed to its physical and theoretical limit. The difference isn't just about power or speed, it's about philosophy. Moto2 proves how brilliant riders can be on equal machinery. MotoGP proves how far human ambition and engineering can go when there are no rules except the laws of physics. If you thought the gap between these two classes was fascinating, wait until you see our next breakdown. We've got a video on the left that dives deep into the one Moto2 champion who spectacularly failed in MotoGPI, and another on the right that reveals the secret technology Ducati is developing for 2025 that will change everything. The world of prototype racing never stops evolving. Dive into the action, choose your hero, and let two-wheeled passion ignite. Watch live and join the excitement today. Like, share, subscribe. Stay connected and fuel your passion. Don't miss a single update from the world of two-wheel racing.